Good morning, everyone. It is great to see everybody here today. If you have your Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 9. We're going to begin our study there in just a moment. Mark chapter 9. Hopefully everybody had a great weekend as we prepare for a new week. It's always great to gather together as the people of God and to study from His Word. So thank you for being here. We may have visitors among us that I can't see. Thank you for being here. And if you have any Bible questions, please be sure to let us know. Well, back in March, I preached a sermon called, He Who Is Not Against Us Is For Us. And that text came from Mark chapter 9. It was a statement that Jesus made. It's a statement that a lot of people often have questions concerning. And so we spent some time doing some studying in that particular passage. And if you have more questions about that, you can go back and listen to that sermon. It really does make for a very interesting Bible study. There's another passage, though, in the Gospel of Mark that I want us to consider this morning. And there are often questions associated with this statement that Jesus made as well that we find in Mark chapter 9. And it's a statement where Jesus said, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Are you familiar with the text, the passage, the the context by which Jesus said this? It's a very interesting study, and I want to spend a few minutes this morning spending some time really just kind of walking us through this particular context. And so our study this morning is going to begin in Mark chapter 9 and verse number 14. And I believe as we study this this morning, that there are great lessons for us to immediately apply in our lives. And so join with me, if you will, please, primarily, for the most part, we'll be in this one particular chapter in Mark chapter 9. So as we begin our study, we'll get down to this passage where Jesus said, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. But before we do that, we need to understand a couple of things that were taking place in Mark chapter 9. So when you look at the first part of Mark chapter 9, the first 13 verses here, we see Jesus with what you could call his inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. They were on the mountain and they saw Jesus transfigured. And that certainly is a whole other sermon. Excellent study to look at the transfiguration of Jesus and all that that really entailed. And so they saw Jesus interacting with Moses, and they saw Jesus also interacting with Elijah. And so we pick up the text here in verse number 14. In verse number 14, we find Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they, they come back, and they join up with the other apostles, the other disciples, and there is a conversation that has taken place. Look, at with, uh, look with me in verse number 14. The Bible says, when they came back to the disciples... They saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. While we're not giving the details exactly about why the scribes were arguing with the other uh, apostles here, I think we may have some more understanding as we continue to read this text. It could have been that the scribes were maybe trying to discredit the apostles for the failure that is going to be revealed. And if you notice the, the, the rest of the story that we find in the Gospel of Mark and the other Gospels for that matter, we know that the scribes were always looking for some kind of opportunity to fight against Jesus and also the apostles. Something is interesting, though, in verse 14 and verse 15. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, and that's a phrase that Mark will use all throughout the gospel. He uses this phrase numerous times, immediately. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And I love that, that the imagery that we see there, that all throughout the ministry of Jesus, there were thousands of people that would follow him, the crowds, the multitudes, they want to follow him and listen to him, and now they see him. And what are they doing? They're running, to, uh, running up to greet him. And can you imagine how the scribes must have felt as they saw these uh, crowds running to meet Jesus? We know that they would not have been happy about this. And so as Jesus and the other apostles gather together and they see this crowd and this whole conversation taking place, Jesus asks the question. He says, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him. And we know that one in the crowd is going to be this man. He is a father. One of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with the spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, and grinds his teeth, and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. So as you look at these verses here, it becomes clear what's going on here. 
we see that the disciples of Jesus had failed to cast out a demon. And it is a very interesting interaction that we're going to find that is going to take place. And so this man begins to tell Jesus exactly what happened, that he has a son, he's possessed with the spirit, which makes him mute. And we get all these details which really demonstrate just how terrible this situation really was. A couple of things I want to share with you regarding these verses here. Number one, we know that demon possession was real in the first century. We know that demon possession was real throughout the first century, and certainly Jesus had the power to cast out demons. And it's interesting because for the most part, you see demon possession primarily during the ministry of Jesus. There are some other cases that we read about in the book of Acts, but for the most part, it's during the ministry of Jesus. And it could have been the case that that we see so much demon possession because the devil knew that his defeat was ultimately at hand. There's a passage in John chapter 12, we've just hit the pause button here real quickly, in John chapter 12 that may shed some more light on this. In John 12, as Jesus was speaking about how he was going to die, in John 12, verse 30, 31, and 32, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come from my, for my sake, but for your sakes. Listen to what he said here next. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And so I think Jesus is helping us to see here this, the, the defeat of Satan. It was, it was near. It was, it was about to happen. Jesus would soon be lifted up from the earth, and he would die on the cross. In our Bible reading, if you remember in Luke chapter 10, earlier this year we read from Luke chapter 10, and we find Jesus, he had sent out, I believe he had sent out uh, the 70. And what we find here in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 17, he had given them authority and power to perform miracles. And what we see in verse 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And so I think this language here, not literally, but rather seeing his power being taken away and the fact that his fall would be certain. So when we go back to the text in Mark chapter 9, we know that demon possession was real, and we know that this particular spirit or demon was vicious. You look again in the text in verse number uh, 18, the man says whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. What else is interesting about this passage here is that the man had some understanding. He apparently went to his disciples, to the disciples of Jesus. Why? Because he knew that they had some kind of power. Look back in Mark chapter 3. We know that the disciples of Jesus had been given power by Jesus in Mark chapter 3. Look with me in Mark chapter 3, and I want you to notice in verse number 14. The Bible says here in verse number 14, And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. So certainly this man knew some things about Jesus and his disciples, that indeed they had this authority, this power to cast out demons. And he certainly would have been aware that they had been successful in times past. Turn over to Mark chapter 6, and I want you to notice two verses here. In Mark chapter 6, And I want you to notice verse number 7 and verse number 13. Mark chapter 6, verse number 7 and verse number 13. The Bible says here, And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And when you drop down to verse number 13, And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So we know that in times past, they had been successful. So when you go back to our text in Mark chapter 9, what's interesting, and maybe you have a question about this, certainly I did looking at this, why all of a sudden could his disciples not cast out this demon? They had been given authority by Jesus. They had already demonstrated that they had this power to cast out demons. Now, in this particular event, this man whose son, who's in desperate need, is asking and begging that they cast out this demon, and they can't. And so as you continue on in verse number 19, I want you to notice what Jesus said. Jesus is going to respond. He answered them and said, O 
unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And while there was a large crowd there, I think this comment was really more directed towards the apostles. We know, particularly in the Gospels, that Jesus would often rebuke his apostles because of their lack of faith and because of their lack of understanding. And so when you look at verse number 19, he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And it could be that he was also emphasizing some things to this father, as we'll see in just a moment. So look at verse 20. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, so the boy who was demon-possessed, when he saw Jesus, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And, And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. I couldn't help but just think about, when you look at what happened in verse number 20, it's just interesting that this spirit is now throwing this boy around, and and Jesus is still like having this conversation. He's still having this conversation with his father, and all of these events are taking place right before him. What's interesting about this as well is that the demons had a good understanding about who Jesus was. They had a really good understanding of Jesus. You go back to the very first chapter in Mark chapter 1. And Mark chapter 1 and verse number 23 and 24, look over there, and Mark chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. We know that Jesus obviously had the power to cast out demons, and the demons also knew some things about him. This is a case where Jesus was in a synagogue, and verse number 23, the Bible says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. You see what the spirit said? I know who you are. Jesus of Nazareth, you are the Holy One of God. And so this is, I think, why we find this young boy now being thrown around and back in Mark chapter 9 as Jesus is having this conversation with this uh, boy's father. So go back with me to Mark chapter 9. Let's continue our reading here. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus asked the, the father a question in verse 21. He asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Now put your shoes or put yourself in the shoes of the father. How terrible this must have been, right? To see your child from childhood having this spirit, this unclean spirit. And again, we don't have all the details about this, but this is something terrible that is happening. And I want you to see the response of the father. He had already gone to the disciples and asked that they might be able to cast out the demon, and they failed. And so I want you to see what he says next to Jesus. And verse number uh, 22, he said from childhood in verse 21, then he said, it, is often, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So we get some additional details. But watch what he said next. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. See, this man was in need of help. And he's, he's begging Jesus, please, take pity on us. You can only imagine what this man was experiencing, having to see this and go through this every day. And I think if I was this man, not I think I know, if I was this man, I'd be just as desperate as he was. I'd go to the disciples as well. I'd want to find out who could help me with this situation. And now he's turned to Jesus. Did you notice what he said in verse 22 and how he said it? It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Listen to what he said next. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. That's an interesting statement. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. Why did he say it in this manner? Did he say it in that manner because he had already saw the disciples fail? Now he was already having some doubts about whether or not Jesus could actually cast out this demon? Or had he just been around the demon for so long and thought maybe this is just how life is going to be? But if you can do this, please have pity on us. And that statement is interesting. If you think that statement is interesting, look at verse 23. And verse 23, Jesus said to him, if you can. 
So he raises a question, if you can. How do you think Jesus asked that or said that to the man? If you, if, if you can, doesn't it sound like he's just reiterating what the man just told him? Jesus, if you can do this, please have pity on us. And now Jesus is saying, wait a second, what? If, if you can, of course I can. Of course I have this power. And that's why I think he says next in verse 23, all things are possible to him who believes. See, Jesus is wanting to help this, this father to understand some things. There was, a, there was a lack of faith in this father with respect to what Jesus could do. And I love that phrase, all things are possible to him who believes. What a powerful thought. Now we have to be careful with that phrase because sometimes people can use this phrase out of context. Man, Jesus said all things are possible if you just believe. That means I can do anything, right? I'm going to go hike the, 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 the closest mountain I can hike the, tomorrow. Well, be careful with how I use this phrase, all things are possible to him who believes. Be sure that you understand how Jesus used it here, particularly in the context. Jesus is wanting this father to understand that, that there was a lack of faith on his part and that Jesus certainly could cast out this demon. In fact, after he said this, immediately, and that's another statement that John or Mark used all the time, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus, I do believe. And it's interesting, he's still saying, help my unbelief. Now watch how Jesus responded. And verse number 25, when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter into him again. So this father had begged Jesus to have pity on him. He said, I believe, and yet help my unbelief, acknowledging that his trust wasn't where it needed to be. Now we see Jesus is about to respond. He told that demon, that deaf and mute spirit, you come out of this boy, and you do not return back into him. Look at verse 26. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand raised him and he got up so Jesus accomplished exactly what this father wanted there was no doubt that Jesus could demonstrate or that Jesus could heal this boy that he could cast out this demon and so what we find in this situation here is that the father's the, the father's wish his son was now healed and and Jesus demonstrated his power but that's not the end of the story because we continue on in verse number in verse number 27, Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. When he came into the house, watch what happens. His disciples began questioning him privately. So now they're all alone. Now they have some time together. Now they, they need some help. Okay, Jesus, help us out. Why could we not drive it out? So look what he said in verse 29. He said to them, and he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. You understand what that means now? This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. So what does that mean? Well, when you look at the context of the story, I think what we learn here is that the apostles lacked the faith to cast out this demon. Now remember, looking at other passages surrounding this context, particularly in verse number 19, when Jesus said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. It appears that he was already beginning to rebuke his disciples there. And to make it really clear, if some are still having some difficulty with this answer here, that they were lacking appropriate faith to cast out this demon, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 17 with me, please. The same event is recorded in Matthew chapter 17. And in Matthew chapter 17, we're not going to read all of this because we just got done reading it. In Matthew 17, though, you can pick up the crowd or pick up the story in verse number 14, and we see the same things that are taking place. Verse number 19 of Matthew chapter 17, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because, here it is, because of the littleness 
of your faith. That's the answer. Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so Jesus makes it abundantly clear that they lack the proper faith to be successful with this particular demon. They failed to trust in the power of God. It's been said that that phrase to remove mountains or to remove this mountain is a metaphor of just the idea of making difficulties vanish. If they had the proper faith, they would have been able to successfully cast out that particular demon. So when Jesus said through prayer and back in Mark chapter 9, I think he's just saying that this particular demon would only come out through a faith that that sought God through prayer. That there was a lack of faith with these apostles at this particular moment. But that raises some questions. Didn't Jesus already, or didn't the apostles already cast out demons? Well, they had. But on this occasion, their faith wavered. And when you really look at some of the surrounding context in other passages, we see here that that at times their faith often wavered. Look at Mark chapter 8. Remember in Mark chapter 8, we looked at this last week. I want to go back here quickly in Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8 and verse number 4, remember in Mark chapter 8 and verse number 4, his disciples answered him, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy this people? This is another account of Jesus getting ready to perform a miracle where he's going to feed thousands of individuals. Now, The disciples are asking a question, where are we even going to find enough bread to feed these people? The problem with that statement was Jesus had already demonstrated to them back in Mark chapter 6 that he had the power to to, to feed thousands. He fed 5,000 people with 12 baskets full left over. And so we know that at times the apostles struggled with their faith. And verse number 17 of the same chapter, Mark chapter 8, look at this. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, 12. Then he said, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? So I think what Jesus is trying to drive home here is, listen, you're not where you really need to be. I've been showing you these miracles for a long time. And you have ears to hear, but you're not truly hearing. You have eyes to see, but you're truly not seeing. What else is interesting here is that, that they were spiritually blind to some degree at times, and their faith just wasn't where it needed to be. And what's interesting about this whole situation here in Mark 8 is that when you continue reading in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his, eye, laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. Now, why did it take a two-step process in this particular miracle for Jesus to heal this blind man? Well, it wasn't because Jesus didn't have enough power or Jesus had some type of off day or something like that. I'm beginning to think that Jesus performed this miracle in this particular manner to demonstrate to his disciples maybe where they were spiritually. While they could see, they were still seeing some things dimly, and that they were not seeing fully some things that they needed to understand about Jesus and who he was. Now, at times they did. At times, Jesus, or the apostles, like in Mark chapter 8, Peter answered in verse number 29 and said, Jesus, you are the Christ. And and they would understand some of these things, and yet as you continue on in Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9, Peter's going to be rebuked by Jesus. Jesus is going to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan. And so even in Mark chapter 9, look at verse number 31. We see that the apostles were not still where they needed to be. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask. And verse 20, 33 and 34, 
the disciples are having a conversation with one another, and Jesus wants to know, hey, hey, what are, what are you talking about? I think he already knew what they were talking about, and they didn't want to answer what they were talking about because they were talking about who's going to be the greatest. Have you ever had that conversation with someone here at West Main? Hey, who's the greatest at West Main? We don't have that conversation, right? But they're having that conversation. Who's the greatest? There was a problem of pride and a lack of faith, a lack of faith at times with these men. And so when you put all of this together, they at times did not fully understand. They at times struggled with pride. They struggled with having the proper faith. And so when Jesus makes that statement in Mark chapter 9, he's pointing to the fact because that they couldn't cast out that particular demon because they did not have the proper faith in God and in the power from him. That's my understanding of the text. If you have questions about it, I'd love to hear from you. And Maybe you've studied this before. With the time that we have left, I think there are some powerful thoughts for us to consider. When you look back at this story in Mark chapter 9, this is a story about people struggling with their faith. It's a story of a father struggling with his faith. It's a story of the disciples struggling as well. And when you really think about us, at times we are no different. At times we can struggle with our faith. And the first thought I want to leave with you this morning from this study from Mark chapter 9 is that if you're struggling with your faith, you're not alone. Because at times we see others who struggled with their faith. And we know that demon possession is no longer taking place. We know that miracles, I don't believe miracles are any longer taking place. And yet sometimes our lives can look like Our lives can look like we're demon-possessed sometimes with the addictions we struggle with and the horrendous things sometimes we may even find ourselves doing. I know demon possession is no longer taking place, but make no mistake about it, we are in a spiritual war. We know that we still have an enemy, the devil, and he is still after us. And sometimes we can find ourselves struggling, which means that we're going to have to trust in God. If you're struggling with your faith this morning, make sure that you know that you're not alone. When you look at this story here, Don't be embarrassed to make the Father's request your own. He's crying out to Jesus. I believe, and yet help my unbelief. Go to God knowing that you're in need of his help and recognize that there is room for you and for me to grow in our faith. And as we think about this story here, I think one of the great lessons for us to take away as well is that as we go to God in prayer, that we need to pray with great faith. That as we approach his throne, we need to approach his throne with confidence. We need to approach his throne knowing that he is able to provide for us. He's given us the evidence that he is able. He's given us the evidence that he has the power. Now, as we go to God in prayer, we pray according to his will. And we know that he will always answer appropriately according to his will. But I will tell you, it makes me think of passages like Matthew chapter 6. Where Jesus spoke and he said, do not worry. I'm going to provide the very things that you need. And we need to hold on to that and have great confidence that God is going to provide. It reminds me of passages even like 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul prayed three times that this thorn and the flesh might be removed. And Jesus responded with, my grace is sufficient for you. As we pray, even though we may struggle at times with our faith, We need to go to God in prayer with confidence and know that he will answer on our behalf according to his will and then give us exactly what we need. And finally, ultimately, we need to remain with Jesus at all times. The apostles struggled mightily at times with their faith. They they at times saw things dimly. But you know what? They remained with Jesus. They continued with him, and Jesus did not give up on them. He didn't give up on them. They're going to do great things. The same is true for us. So if we find ourselves struggling with our faith or struggling to go to God in prayer with great faith and confidence, don't give up. Remain with him. and He will remain with us. We need to at times increase our faith. That's part of our theme. Increasing in our faith this year. Arise and build. Building our faith. And it could be that some of us are seeing dimly who Jesus really is. You're not the only one at times. We have to trust in him. We have to remain with him. For with him, according to his will, all things are possible for those who believe. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed for Bible classes. The book of Hebrews in this class, Thessalonians in classroom number one.
and all the young people classes in the back. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for this study. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will continue to trust in you at all, at all times. We know, Heavenly Father, that you have the power, that you will provide, and that you will always be with us. Help us, Father, to rely upon you and only you. Help us to increase in our faith and continue to remain with you. 